On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Today, we get to talk about Mark 4, 35 through 41. What's the content of it within the whole storyline of Matthew? So Jesus has been preaching to the crowds in the preceding part of the chapter. And in a very relatable sense, he's tired. He's ready for a break. So he and the disciples get in a boat and decide to cross over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. During that journey, though, a storm comes up and threatens to capsize the boats. The apostles are scared for their lives. They wake up Jesus and Jesus calms the sea and we move on. I like that there's more to the story than meets the eye. See, it's a story that's a miracle, but not a miracle in the way we often expect it. Sometimes when we read these stories, we see Jesus turn the water into wine and we go, oh, it's just a a neat party trick. Yes, it's a power of God, but is there anything more to that? Well, there is here. When Jesus calms the sea, he says, quiet, be still. If we've been following along in the series in Mark, we should recognize that he said that before. Back in chapter one, this is how he cast out the demon. See, there's more going on here than just a simple, I'm going to calm nature. This is Jesus showing power over nature and the supernatural realm as well. See, in their culture, nothing can contain the sea. The sea is a place of chaos, the place of terror. How can you hold back the storms, right, that are going to come across your life? In the Old Testament, no one can do that, except one, the God of Israel. In Job 9, 8, it is that God who walks on the backs of the sea, who has power over nature and the supernatural. This story is a claim of Jesus fitting into that narrative, fitting into that ideal of, I am the God of the Old Testament. I'm the God of creation. I can control everything. It's a powerful reminder to his disciples of who he is, not just a good teacher, preaching good morals that we should love one another, but it's a claim to authority and a claim to power. After calming the ocean, he goes to his disciples and asks, why were you afraid? And that's a bit of a rebuke. It's a bit of a challenge. If you believed everything I've said so far, why were you afraid that even a storm, no matter how terrifying, would actually threaten you? That kind of sticks with us, I think, as a challenge of, is our faith big enough? Are we willing to see that God is this great God, not just merely a good moral teacher, the creator of the universe. I think it's a reminder for us to challenge our own preconceptions. Do we have too small of a view of God? Do we only trust in him when things are going well? Or when life is metaphorically chaotic, when the storms come upon us, do we trust that we serve a God who can still the storms in our lives, even in the worst of times? Hello, I'm Dr. Shelley Hogan with the College of Theology here with Dr. Laura Chesniak Phipps, and we're going to be discussing Mark 4. When you read the story of Jesus calming the sea uh, during a storm and you think about it, um, what are some principles or aspects of the story that really stick out to you? One of the things I think about when I hear this is just the stress in my own life or maybe getting wrapped up too much in the problems I may be going through and losing focus on my faith. And really it helps me to remember I need to rely on my faith. It will help me get through whatever I'm experiencing as it has in the past and just not to forget that that's there to kind of support me through that. Right. Too often we seem to focus on the circumstances Mm -hmm. instead of the God who's over all circumstances. Exactly. How do you bring yourself back to that place? I think just kind of prayer, meditating, um, really focusing on the bigger picture and Mm -hmm. knowing that the things that I'm experiencing day to day aren't really the issues that I need to be focusing on. Um, So I think about those things and that helps me to maybe center myself a little bit. 
Right, because seasons change and pass, right? Exactly. What are some of the ways this story and these principles can be applied to your workplace? I think one of the things I notice, I'm with students in the classroom every day. Mm -hmm. So I have usually 300 students a semester, and they come in with a lot of stress and uncertainty. And I think it's really normal for these young adults to be experiencing that, Mm -hmm. right? There's uncertainty in their career, their relationships, what major they're going to go into living away from home. Kind of when I think about the story and how it relates to my professional life and being with students is thinking about that example of Jesus calming the storm and Mm -hmm. how can I calm the storm for my students. So I try and do things like focus on how can my class be a safe space? How can I help them in terms of expectations? Mm -hmm. So if they know what they need to do in my class, how to prepare for exams, for papers, That helps to reduce the stress. Right. Um, And in psychology, a lot of times students will tell us their problems, tell us, and it can be more serious problems. So I think even just connecting them to resources is a way that I can be a calm for them. Doing those things, praying with them, praying for them, all of that can help support them through those stressful storms that they're experiencing. Right. Because just because you're in college doesn't mean life stops. Exactly. There's life and death and emergencies and so forth. Right. So then what are one or two ways that you um, guide the students uh, in reflecting on this, say this story and Jesus calming the storms and the principles that we've discussed? What are some ways you implement that in the classroom? Yeah. In my classroom, I like to try and connect faith with the concepts. And Mm -hmm. sometimes that can be difficult, but I feel like this one is really straightforward. And in psychology, it fits really well, but I can see it in any classroom. We talk a lot about pro-social behavior in Mm -hmm. our class and how that can improve mental well-being. Using Jesus again as that example, how can you act your faith? How can you live your faith? And by being there for other people, calming the storms for people in your community, serving others, you are emulating right? What you Mm -hmm. saw Jesus do, you are acting on your faith, you're living that, and that can really help individuals around you. And not only are you helping them, but it also supports your own mental health. We see that in the research. So I think when I explain that concept to them in psychology, but then also they can see the parallel really Mm -hmm. easily um, to the scripture, it brings it together very nicely. So how would you define Um, pro-social? Yeah, pro-social behavior would just be any kind of helping behavior. So Mm -hmm. it could be things like volunteering. Mm -hmm. It could be comforting someone in need. It might be donating. Um, There's a lot of different ways, but it's essentially the behavior doing something for others with no reward for yourself. So almost being proactive instead of reactive. Exactly. This calming the storm and calming the sea, being able to minister to others in their time of need really shows that, that you're not alone. Exactly. And there's there's a presence there, which is what the disciples had to learn in that boat, that even though it looked like Jesus was silent or asleep, he was still present and quickly able to intercede on their right. behalf. In the classroom, do you use any scripture verses? One of the things I do with my students is we have a prayer forum that we put on our halo. And so they can put things there um, and we can pray for each other that way. We typically will start with prayer at the beginning. But I do like using the 15 for 15, bringing those in. Well, thank you so much, Laura, for sharing all this with us and sharing a little bit about your classroom with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you.